Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Story Corner Adventures. We're about to embark on chapter six of The Wheel on the School. Now you will recall at the end of chapter five, after Peer and Dirk had finished talking with the owner of the cherry tree, uh, they encountered Yella and Ilka. And we have no idea yet why they have pieces of a wheel and why they're soaking wet, particularly Yella, who we saw at the end of chapter four. Now, before we go on and find out the answer to that mystery, which is going to take quite a long time, in fact, chapter six is so long, we will be reading it in two uh, bits because it does divide in half very easily. Before we do that, let's just review the parts of the wheel because you'll need to know the parts of the wheel definitely for this chapter. So we've got the hub which goes onto the axle of the cart. We have spokes which hold the hub to the center of the wheel and keep the wheel round and true. The spokes of this wheel are made out of wood. We have the inner rim which are made of sections of wood and the outer rim which is one long continuous iron band. Okay, now, as the last two chapters did, this chapter overlaps in time. It starts just after the students have been dismissed and Ilka is also given one road out of Shora to look for a wheel. So let's find out how successful he is. I'm going to be adding a couple of pictures during this particular chapter because there are some things that get a little bit complicated as far as the scene goes and they don't have illustrations in the book that have enough detail for you to fully get what's going on. So let's see how we can do here. Chapter 6, Ilka and the Ancient Wheel. Ilka had been given the canal road to search. It was an important road that followed the canal all the way to the village of Hantum. Ilka did not expect to get to Hantum. The canal road had far too many farms. He searched each farm in his own slow, thorough way. Bit by bit, he worked himself far out of Shora. In his own way, Ilka hurried. At the end of a bush-lined lane that led to a huge ancient farmhouse, a young farmer suddenly stepped from behind the bushes and barred Ilka's way. And just what are you snooping around for? Saw you at the next farm, too. Just what business did you have nosing around that farm with nobody home? Oh, Ilka said, startled. He eyed the tall, thin farmer wondering if it would be wise to take to his heels, but quickly decided there wouldn't be much use in his running away. He tried a slow, sure smile instead. Oh, I wasn't exactly snooping, he told the farmer as calmly as he could. I was looking for a wagon wheel. Have you got a spare wagon wheel? Huh? The farmer said it was his turn to be startled. You see, Ilka explained, our school needs a wagon wheel because we're trying to make the storks come back to Shora. The whole school's doing it. Ilka explained the big plans and the project. His calm, slow, thorough explanation seemed to satisfy the farmer. Well now, he said, it must be Providence or something. To keep an eye on you on that next farm, I climbed into the hayloft of our old second barn. We haven't used that hayloft since my great-grandfather's days. But what do you know? There's an old wagon wheel there. If it's a year old, it's a hundred. I didn't know it was there. I wouldn't have found it now, but run into the little window to keep an eye on you. I tripped over the thing. It was buried under old hay. Skinned my ankles, too. Boy, I can tell you I didn't feel too good about your making me go on my face into that dust and dead hay. Golly, no, Ilka said. 
He eyed the tall farmer warily. Three long strides and the farmer would have him if he ran. Well, I can't say I'm glad that happened, but I am glad you found the wheel, if I can have it. The farmer grinned. That's sure putting it the straightforward way. I suppose you can have it. No reason why not, I guess. It's so old and big and clumsy, it wouldn't fit any of our wagons today. You mean I can have it? Just like that? Ilka had to ask again. It was too simple and too easy after his long, hard search. If you can get it down, you can have it. It's no good to anybody here. Ilka eyed the high barn. So this is what I picture when I picture a high barn. It may not be the actual one that uh, Mr. De Jong was writing about, but it's how I envision it. He pointed to two double doors high in the front gable of the barn, directly under the peak of the roof. Is that where it is? Way up there? Could I get it through the hay doors and let it down with a rope? The farmer studied the barn. Yes, if you open both doors. That's the way it must have gotten in, because the trap door inside the loft is far too small. You'd have to get help, though. You can see I'm all dressed up. I was ready to set out for Hantum when I first saw you down the road, and I'm way late now from hanging around to keep an eye on you. I wouldn't try it alone. That wheel's heavy, and if you try to let it down with a rope, it's liable to take you down with it. You can see it's pretty high. Could I go up just to look at it? Well, the farmer hesitated. The help is all back on the farm. Nobody around. Well, go ahead. But didn't you say the whole school was, in a, was at it? Better get the whole school to help you. I wouldn't try it alone. But I've got to get to Hantum. Abruptly, the farmer set off down the lane. Halfway down the lane, the farmer turned. I'll take a chance on you. Fat, slow kids are usually pretty honest. They have to be. They can't run away. So I expect you to leave things alone in that barn. But the wheel is yours. Go right ahead. He was off again. Ilka stood, staring up at the barn, wondering whether to get the others to help or to try it all alone. Imagine his coming rolling a big wheel to the school all alone. They'd never thought he could do much of anything because he was so fat and slow and clumsy. <gasps> Wouldn't their eyes pop? Yilka's own eyes popped as he imagined the picture. He hurried into the barn. Imagine it, if he could be the one to bring the wheel to school. Yilka climbed heavily up the long, rickety, dried-out ladder that led to the high hayloft. The ladder groaned and squeaked under him. Ilka was puffing when he pushed his head through the little trapdoor opening. There it was. There lay the wheel. It lay deep and heavy and ponderous among the age-old hay settlings on the floor of the hayloft. It was exposed. The scrambled markings in the hay dust settlings where the farmer had sprawled full length were all around it. Panting as much from excitement as from the hard climb, Ilka stood over it. He had a wheel. It was his, his for the lowering, his for the rolling it back to school. Maybe they'd all be standing empty-handed in the schoolyard when he came rolling up with the wheel. But this was no time to dream about it and make great proud pictures in his head. Yilka hurried to the double doors, unhooked them, and fiercely pushed them open. They slammed against the outside wall. Now there was light. He hurried back to the wheel to examine it by the new light. He felt solemn looking down at a century-old wheel. The farmer had said it was a hundred, if it was a year. He prodded it with his toe. 
He felt solemn and excited all at the same time, here in the deep silence of the ancient barn. From a crossbeam high above him dangled the end of a heavy rope. That must have been the hay rope they'd used to pull the hay into this loft. Maybe it was a hundred years old too. It was Providence, just as the farmer had said. Not only did he have a wheel, but there was the rope to lower it down to the ground. Ilka hitched himself up the smooth upright beam to get to the rope on the cross beam. The farmer hadn't said anything about using the rope, but he wouldn't know a, he would know a rope was needed to lower the wheel to the ground. Ilka dragged himself cautiously along the cross beam around which the old rope had been coiled. From his high perch, he saw the wheel directly below him. His wheel! He hesitated no longer, uncoiled the rope, loosened the knot, and let it drop down on the wheel. He slid down the upright beam and hastily tied one end of the rope around the rim of the wheel. He dragged the wheel flat on its hub across the gritty floor to the hay door opening. On hands and knees, Ilka leaned out of the high barn. He gasped a little. It looked twice as high from the open doorway as it had from the ground below. Ilka eyed the long rope on the hayloft floor. He decided it must be plenty long enough to let the wheel down to the ground, far as it seemed. But could he do it? Could he hold it when all its heavy weight hung outside the barn, dangling from the end of the rope? From his high post in the hay door opening, Ilka stared over the flat countryside, hoping wishing there was somebody to help him. Far away across the level fields, he could just see the sharp roof of Shora's little school. Maybe it would be better to get the others. Suddenly, a commotion on a distant road caught Ilka's eye. Wasn't that Yella? It was. Yella had a wheel. He was rolling a wheel toward the school. Yella had beaten him as always. In utter disappointment, Ilka stared at the rolling wheel on the distant road. Then, from his height, Ilka saw the farmer, saw him sneaking along the bank of a ditch that ran beside the road down which Yella was rolling the wheel. Ilka yelled, yelled with all his might to warn Yella. Yella didn't hear him, the distance was too great. The farmer grabbed Yella. Yella's wheel went wobbling off the side of the road and down into the ditch. Now the farmer led Yella away down the road toward the school. Oh, oh, Ilka said softly. Yella stole that wheel. He stared after Yella and the farmer. He shook his head. But somehow deep inside him, he felt a certain satisfaction. Yella was always the leader and was always scolding him for being slow and clumsy and coming in behind. Yella didn't even want him in his games most of the time. But now, if he could get this big wheel down, he'd be the leader. For once, he'd be the leader. All Ilka's misgivings flitted away before his new determination for once to outdo Yella. Ilka did not look back at Yella again. He was determined. He pushed the wheel out the open doorway as far as he dared, but not so far that it would overbalance and shoot down to the ground. Now the wheel lay ready to be lowered. Ilka studied the situation. Maybe it would be best to tie the other end of the rope around his chest. That would leave his hands free in case he had to grab and hang on to something to keep the wheel from pulling him out of the high hayloft. With the rope knotted around his chest, Ilka took the precaution of walking around the same upright beam he had climbed to get the rope. With the rope going around the beam, the big wheel would not have a direct pull. 
If the wheel should drag him, it would first have to pull him across the floor away from the doorway and clear around the upright beam. The rope proved to be long enough so that Ilka could walk around the beam with it and still get back to the open doorway where the wheel lay. Ilka did not hesitate now. With his foot, he gave the wheel a hard shove. The big wheel teetered for a moment, tipped down, and shot out of the high doorway. Behind Ilka, the slack rope snaked and became taut. With a terrific yank, Ilka was jerked off his feet. He fell backward, flat on his back. The flying rope dragged him through dust and stalks toward the upright beam. Ilka had his sense enough to put out his hands to keep from crashing head first into the beam. For a moment, he clung to the smooth beam. But the speed, having trouble turning the page here, but the speed of the falling wheel outside the barn jerked him around the beam, twisted him so that now he was flat on his face and tore his hands free before he could get a secure hold. Ilka shot across the hayloft floor toward the wide open doorway. There was nothing to grab. He clutched wildly at the haystalks. There was nothing to slow him. Ilka sprawled his legs wide in a dis desperate effort to slow himself. His hands clawed the rope around his chest. He frantically tried to undo the knot. There was no time. There was the open doorway. Ilka grabbed blindly and dug nails and fingers into the old dead wood of the door jam. Somehow he held. The weight of the wheel spun him around. As he clung with his hands, his feet went out the doorway. For an unbelievable and horrible moment, Ilka hung. His shoes flew off his feet, and because the moment seemed so long, it seemed to take time before he heard his shoes hit the hard-packed ground below. He scrabbled for a stronger, surer hold on the worn door jam. Then a horrible y yank shook through his whole body. The rope wasn't long enough. The wheel was hanging above the ground, hanging from him like an awful pendulum. The rope around his chest slipped down. There was a brief blind moment of hope that it would slip right down his dangling legs and off him, but the rope caught around Ilka's thick waist. Ilka hung by his fingers. Far below him, suspended from him by the thick old rope, the wheel dangled against the wall of the barn. These were blinding short moments. There could not be many more moments. He could never hold the wheel, hanging as he was by his hands. Ilka closed his eyes, his breath wrenched out of him. All he could do was cling another moment of eternity, and if possible, yet another. At that point, the rope broke. The wheel crashed below. The strain was gone. The strain on his waist and clutching fingers. Suddenly there was breath again and a feeling of heavenly lightness, as if he were flying, as if he could fly. And with new strength, Ilka tugged himself up and dragged himself up through the doorway. When his legs were safely in the loft, he stretched full length in the dust and stalks, and sobbed. It was good to lie and sob, never to have to stir again. Then Ilka remembered the crashing sound the wheel had made. Slowly, timidly, flat on the floor, he put his head out of the doorway. He just lay and stared. There was the wheel smashed into a hundred pieces. Only the iron rim with its inside wooden rim had stayed together. The big hub had rolled away. The spokes lay scattered in every direction. Ilka groaned. His narrow escape was forgotten in his utter disappointment. The wheel was all in pieces. Gone was the proud vision of rolling the wheel to school. Ilka slowly got up. He pulled the two hay doors shut and remembered to latch them. Without bothering to undo the piece of broken rope still knotted around his waist, he went down the long ladder, staring blank-faced at nothing. The wreckage was complete. 
Ioka looked gloomily at the shattered wheel before him. He picked up his wooden shoes, examined them to see if they'd split, then slid them on his feet. He turned to go, but looked back. Could the wheel be put together again? He still had all the parts. He started gathering up the scattered spokes. They made a staggering armful. There was still the hub, and if he was to roll the rim away, he would need both his hands. Ilka pondered. The rope, still knotted around his waist, provided a solution. One by one, he shoved the spokes under the tight rope around his waist until he was ringed by spokes. He had to walk very straight. He could hardly stoop to pick up the heavy hub. But what to do with the hub? He couldn't carry it in his hands because his hands had to be kept free to roll the rim to Shora. Walking stiffly in his clumsy corset of wheel spokes, Ilka went to the rope that lay over the rim. By jerking and snapping the old rope, he broke it. It unraveled and parted, strand by strand. Now, he had a short length of rope. He tied it around the hub, lowered the hub carefully over his shoulder, and tied the other end to the rope still knotted around his waist. There, that solved the problem of the hub. Now the rim. He could hardly reach down to it, encased as he was in wheel spokes. At last, he got it off the ground and standing upright. Harnessed in spokes, the heavy hub unwieldy on his back, Ilka got the rim rolling. He trotted stiffly beside it. Down the farm lane, the wheel rim rolled very nicely, but on the rutted canal road, it developed a mean tendency to bump down into one of the two wagon ruts or to hit pebbles and suddenly veer toward the deep canal. Ilko couldn't move quickly. He could only do one thing. Whenever the rim veered toward the canal, he knocked it flat before it could plunge into the water. The straining, struggling Ilka was soon drenched with sweat. He grunted and, pad and panted, but always he picked the rim up again and rolled it on, determined somehow to get it to Shora. He got better at managing the jumpy rim. He found that by keeping it in one of the deep wagon ruts of the canal road, the rut made sort of a track for the rim. Now he was beginning to make progress. The rim rolled down the rut. The loaded Ilka trotted beside. At this pace, they'd soon be in Shora. We're going to take a break for a little bit and you can find the second half of chapter six elsewhere here on the site, Story Corner Adventures. Thanks for listening. See you soon.